Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. And thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. All you've done in us and through us. And we thank God in advance for what God will continue to do for us. What God will do in us. What God will do through us. If God has been good to you, if you have something to be thankful for this day, why don't you put your hands together and give God a hand clap of praise. <clears throat> Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we just need to start this prayer by saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for gathering us here in this place. Thank you for gathering your people from generation to generation so that we today may stand in this place together, standing by your amazing grace and in the presence of your Holy Spirit. We pray that on this Pentecost Sunday that your spirit would come and dwell among us. We pray that your spirit would move us Heal us, gather us, empower us, free us. Come, Holy Spirit. We pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts may be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit. All God's people say, amen. amen. Beloved, this Pentecost, we pray this ancient and simple prayer of the church throughout the service. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. What a powerful prayer. This one prayer has the power to transform your entire life. And this one prayer has the power to gather and transform us as the church, the very body of Christ. And yes, you've heard this prayer or some form of it in all areas of church life, in business meetings and in prayer meetings in Bible study and in small groups, in hospital rooms and at grave sites. It's a wonderful prayer, a prayer that invites us fully into wonder. It's a prayer that we pray when we're seeking discernment over life's most puzzling problems. And it's a prayer we pray when we're navigating disorder, divisions, disagreements, inside a congregation or in a splintering denomination. And so we pray this morning, come Holy Spirit. Say it with me, come Holy Spirit. What an expectation, what a hope, what a deep desire is expressed in this prayer as we ask that God's Holy Spirit may dwell here among us, that God will intervene once again in history as God has done in the past, that God will make a way out of no way as God has always done, and to bring forth creation out of chaos. And truly, there are times where it seems this prayer summons the Holy Spirit into a place. As small and large miracles start to happen, we, we experience hearts being healed, minds being transformed, harms being repaired, and the church being edified. And yet, we must always remember that correlation does not always mean causation. And truly, there are times when this prayer seems to ring completely hollow, and nothing seems to be changing at all and no spirit power is breaking forth. That meeting that continues to be distracted by unnecessary details. A relationship that continues in disarray and dysfunction. A general conference that continues to be uninspired. With these observations and discrepancies, we may be tempted to do an analysis of them, to look at those times where prayer worked and those times where prayer didn't work. Maybe if we deconstruct it enough, we can fine-tune the wording uh, and the circumstances so that we can get the Holy Spirit every time. Maybe we can reverse engineer the prayer into a delightful carnival game where everyone is a winner. Now that would be a great marketing tool. Now that would gain us the cash flow and prestige that we would truly need to be a real player on the world stage. But in this way, after Come Holy Spirit, we could safely add and give us everything our heart desires simply because we say so. Beloved, prayer is not transactional. 
Prayer is not transactional in some kind of consumeristic or mechanical sense. This prayer is not a magical formula that directs the spirit like a wizard casting a spell. This prayer is not as though we can summon the Holy Spirit like a server at a fancy beachside hotel. Surely if we pray in this spirit for the spirit, God would well respond like God did to Job out of the spirited whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Where were you when I laid the very foundations of the world? God may be love, but God is not our servant to manipulate for our ends. God is a free God, mighty in gentleness and gentle in might. And the Holy Spirit is not obligated to us by some kind of capitalistic subservience. And it is by this spirit of freedom that we understand our own freedom and our own self-worth beyond any soul-defying system of extraction and production. So hear me this morning when I say that you are more than your work. You are more than what you can produce. So we pray this morning, come Holy Spirit. This prayer is not a directive or a demand, but it's rightly understood as an invitation. This prayer is not a command, but rather an opening and an activation of a loving relationship with God. We might be saying, come Holy Spirit, you are invited. You are welcome in this place. Come Holy Spirit, we are listening for you, seeking after you, waiting for you. Come, Holy Spirit, we are open to receive you, however you might show up, even if it's in a way we don't expect or even a way that we like. Prayer is less about asking and getting the things that we want and need and more about connecting with the eternal and resurrecting God, the God who provides for us in more ways than we could ever understand. And we are called to cultivate that loving relationship, that loving connection with God and build mutual trust. Yes, there's a sense of mutuality because God has already offered God's self to us in Christ Jesus. And we now experience God in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we say, come Holy Spirit. You come exactly as you are God and we will come exactly as we are and we'll meet somewhere in the middle and let's go somewhere together. To be clear, this prayer itself is not mentioned explicitly in any scripture. And yet I am, sh I am certain that some form of this prayer was in the hearts of and on the lips of the first Christ followers, and in their very breath, as they were waiting for God after Christ's ascension. Last week, we celebrated Ascension Sunday, remembering that 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus himself rose into heaven. And Pastor Jay helped remind us that the ascension of Christ reminds us that we were created to fly. We were created to fly by the grace and power and lift of the Holy Spirit. And like the law of gravity, what goes up must come down. And thus the promise of Jesus was that even though Jesus goes up into heaven, the Holy Spirit comes down to earth, pouring out the loving and liberating and life-giving power of the living God. So as Christ's followers, we were, so as Christ's followers were in another in-between space, anticipating some mighty movement of God in their midst, I'm certain this was their prayer, come Holy Spirit. They surely said this prayer together and when they were alone, when they rose in the morning and when they went to bed at night. And I'm sure they said it when they contemplated any decision and when they had time to kill and no social media to doom scroll. They prayed, come Holy Spirit. The first disciples understood that they were waiting for what, what would be in line with the creative character of God. They merely had to remember the creation stories in Genesis. In the beginning, when God was creating the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete. Chaos and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the Spirit of God swept over the face of the waters. And when God was creating flesh that required breath to breathe, God offered God's own spirit, God's own breath, to fill our lungs so that we may truly live. And ever since, we have been in an inspirational relationship with God, living and breathing by the very grace of God herself. Now, this is important to remember because this means that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, has been around since the beginning of the world. And the Spirit has been moving and shaking the world, transforming people and tearing down systems of oppression long before the church got on the scene. So as we celebrate this day of Pentecost and remember this day that the Holy Spirit gave birth to the church, 
Sometimes the church needs to be reminded that we did not start the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit started us. And the Holy Spirit does not work for us exclusively, nor is it the sole uh, property of the church TM. Instead, the Holy Spirit works her power in and through us. The church is gathered and formed by the Holy Spirit. And we must always remember where we came from and where we fit into God's interventions in history. Because we know all too well that the path of destruction is well worn by those who forgot who they were and where they came from. And so this Pentecost, we remember our birthday as the church universal, when our spiritual foremothers and forefathers were just a rugged band of rabbi school dropouts and radical women gathered in the upper room, awaiting the very real presence of God. And while they were together in one place, suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rushing of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house, and divided tongues like fire appeared and rested on each of them, all of them being filled with the Holy Spirit. So once again, we hear this story year after year, and we may be tempted to ask, what exactly did they do to bring forth the Spirit of God? Instead, the text only offers one detail to try to illuminate our path. They were all together in one place. Beloved, we live in a disconnected world. We live in a denomination that is splintering. We are faced with distractions on all sides that are trying to commodify our attention, break down our social bonds, and we face oppression, and we face traumas that seek to tear us down and grind us up. I imagine the first followers of Christ felt this deep in their souls as external threats and internal threats bred conflict and anger and maybe even the impulse to isolate within their beloved community. And yet they remained faithful through it all. For them, faithfulness meant to continue in community, even when it was hard. Faithfulness was about believing in the promises of Christ Jesus that the Spirit would come, and faithfulness was less about the belief that God exists but more about belief in one another. A solemn and sacred trust that God had given them a high purpose and believing that somehow this higher purpose involved each of us, not just me. So it was in their being together that God poured out God's Holy Spirit upon them. So it's in the midst of their grief and their pain and their struggle that they were together in one place. And this is the when and the where that the Holy Spirit showed up. It was not on their time, but on God's time. It was not by their effort alone, but by the amazing grace of God. And the first Christ followers were simply being faithful to God and to one another, and they put themselves in the right position to experience the Spirit of God. You might say it was a faithful gathering of God's faithful. On Pentecost, it may be helpful to define the church, to give it a definition, because this image of the disciples together in one place provides maybe a simple definition of what the church truly is. That we are a Christ-following people, gathered by the Holy Spirit, committed to listening for and following the Holy Spirit. The church is a Christ-following people, gathered by the Holy Spirit, committed to listening for and following that Holy Spirit. You see, this Holy Spirit gathers and anoints us with the same liberating mission that Jesus received back in the Gospel of Luke from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us because God has anointed us to bring good news to the poor. God has sent us to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to those without vision, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of Jubilee. So today we celebrate the birth of the church, beloved. This place that is not the exclusive domain of the Holy Spirit, yet a place wholly committed to the Spirit of God. And to be sure, the Holy Spirit is going to bring forth the kingdom of God with or without us. And yet, as the church, it is our birthright and our destiny to be formed and sent by the Holy Spirit into the world. We co-labor with God to bring forth new life, 
to stir liberation, and to bring it forth and to form the beloved community in which all may find a spiritual home, a place where everyone might find belonging and mutual aid. There are many promises latent in this Pentecost story, but I want to conclude this sermon by focusing on just one. When we trust in God and in one another, we put our whole selves in the right position to experience the Spirit of God. When we trust in God and trust in one another, we put ourselves in the right position to experience the very Spirit of the living God. Life with God is life together. And this life together is all about loving relationship, and this is no easy task. Amen? Trust requires courage. Trust requires vulnerability. And trust requires time and energy to build it up drop by drop, bit by bit, brick by brick. Remember, it took the apostles three years of ministry with Jesus experiencing the great trauma of their rabbi's lynching and to have meals with the resurrected Christ for 40 days before they could truly trust in the Spirit of God, before they could finally open up wholeheartedly to that Spirit. And yet this is the primary work of the church, beloved, to listen for the Spirit, to nurture the beloved community together where we call one another to life and we call one another to love boldly in the world. And as union, we are rebuilding our church community, you know, step by cautious step following the pandemic. And we're building up trust in God and each other through formal things like worship and kids' Sunday school and Bible study and other small groups, through the food pantry ministry and housing justice advocacy, and yes, some fellowship thrown in there every once in a while. And we build up trust in God and in one another in those in-between moments those small moments in between programming where we might offer a friendly smile or have a prayerful conversation. It becomes clear in the accumulation of these moments that we might say, like Alice Walker quoted, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Indeed, we need each other to survive. And the Holy Spirit is building us into the church that the world desperately needs. So the promise of Pentecost is that when we trust in one another and trust in God, we put ourselves in the right position to experience the Spirit of God. So beloved, I invite you to take a moment and look around you. Do you see that there is a sweet, sweet Spirit in this place? There are warm expressions in our joyful singing in our earnest and solemn prayers. I pray that we are experiencing the sweet, sweet spirit here and now. I pray that we experience the sweet, sweet spirit that's drawing our hearts closer and closer together. I imagine the spirit knitting us together like a grandmother and her prayer blanket for the world. So we pray, come Holy Spirit. We are here. We trust in you. Revive us again. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen.